It was August 26, 1765, and Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchison, was seated to dinner with his family. When suddenly he and his family were startled by his front door getting kicked in and a mob of angry civilians rushing into his home. Hutchison and his family narrowly escaped the mob, but his home was still looted, pillaged, dismantled, and abandoned. The reason? A rumor had been spread that Hutchison had vouched for the Stamp Act of 1765, when in all actuality, he had opposed it. Well, despite the truth that Hutchison wasn't in favor of the Stamp Act, it's a little bit late. All of his stuff is long gone. Hello YouTube historians and welcome back to another episode of History Abridged. In today's episode we're going to be exploring the causes of the Revolutionary War. That means we're going to be looking into the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, and the classic phrase, no taxation without representation, and a whole lot more. So without further ado, let's go back in time to colonial America and find out what caused the Revolutionary War. Now before we really begin, we need to understand that colonial America was just an extension of Great Britain. That means that all commerce and all trade in colonial America had to somehow benefit the king, or the crown as we'll be calling them in this video. To ensure that the king benefited from commerce in America, he would impose rigorous taxes on the most popular forms of business in the colonies. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's dig in. In 1764, the crown enacted the Sugar Act which would cut the cost of molasses imported in North America in half. Sounds good, right? Wrong. The lower taxes imposed on the French West Indies, the largest producer of molasses to North America, actually meant it was cheaper for the producers to do business directly with the crown instead of smuggling it to merchants inside the colonies. Furthermore, the Sugar Act restricted colonial courts from being able to try merchants found guilty of smuggling and gave the power instead to the admiralty. Suddenly, convicted smugglers were tried without the benefit of a jury, which almost ensured that punishment was going to be a lot harsher. At the same time, a revenue act was placed on goods like fur, wool, and hides, which had previously been sold to other nations, which Britain couldn't tax. In 1765, British Parliament enacted the Stamp Act of 1765. You remember Hutchison? Well, you're about to find out why people got so mad over the Stamp Act in particular. Unlike the other acts Parliament had passed, which relied on taxing commerce, the Stamp Act required that all forms of documentation, be it books, newspapers, court deeds, land deeds, you name it, pretty much any form of documentation, had a stamp purchased from authorities, British authorities, branded right on the side. The Stamp Act hadn't targeted one class of colonial society, but every free man in colonial society who needed or enjoyed some form of documentation. Along with this enactment, the Crown stationed British soldiers in the colonies to enforce such a law, directly challenging the lofty colonial figureheads who had previously resided over the colonies. American colonists protested that they had the rights of Englishmen, which meant that they had the right to govern their own affairs without the Crown imposing such laws. British colonies around the world, such as India, echoed the same sentiment, claiming that they had the rights of Englishmen to govern themselves. It was because of this sentiment that Governor Francis Bernard of Massachusetts declared, In an empire extended and diversified as that of Great Britain, there must be a supreme legislature, to which all other powers be subordinate. Only the colonists didn't really agree with that opinion. The phrase no taxation without representation, which is famous now, first appeared after the Stamp Act, where colonists openly opposed the taxes being imposed on them by the Crown. The phrase meant that British Parliament didn't have the right to tax the colonies since there were no colonists present in the House of Commons. In simplified terms, you can't make up new rules if the people the rules apply to can't vote on them. Skipping ahead to 1770 and the memorable Boston Massacre. Two years earlier, British soldiers, sometimes referred to as lobster bags for their flashy red coats, had seized John Hancock's ship the Liberty for violating trade regulations. 
The seizure of the Liberty caused tremendous rioting among the colonists, which resulted in British soldiers being stationed all around Boston. On a cold day, March 5th in 1770, some snowball-wielding protesters threw those icy projectiles at some British soldiers, who in turn leveled their muskets and killed five of the protesters. One of those men was Crispus Attucks, a sailor of Native American, African, and white heritage. Crispus was the first martyr of the revolution. Eight soldiers stood trial for the slaughter, but two of them were condemned with manslaughter, while the others went free. However, the ever-classic Paul Revere had a different story. Paul Revere published a narrative, which proved to be false, of a line of British soldiers firing repeatedly on innocent bystanders. This was enough to arouse the anger of every American who read it, which was a lot. Three years later, in 1773, the Crown made a decision that was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. The East India Company, a massive trading monopoly that provided Britain with Asian luxuries like spices, silks, and most importantly, tea, was in dire straits as stocks in their company began to fall drastically. In an attempt to bail them out, the British Parliament decided to allow the East India Company to dump cheap tea into the American market. What this actually did was undermine both established and unestablished merchants in America by making a product that they couldn't compete with the price of. On December 16th, a group of angry colonists dressed as Indians to hide their identities, stormed the East India Company's ships, and threw more than 300 crates of tea overboard into the sea. It became known as the Boston Tea Party, for good reason. The East India Company lost equivalent to four million in merchandise in one night. In response to the Tea Party, British Parliament ordered that Boston's harbors be shut until the lost tea was paid for in full. They replaced elected officials within the colonies with their own men and empowered British soldiers to take lodge and refuge in civilian homes, private homes, to be hosted, fed, and taken care of by the colonists rather than the Crown. All of these measures were known as the Intolerable Acts by the colonists. At the same time, Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which extended the territory of Quebec all the way to the Ohio River. Quebec was predominantly Roman Catholic, which was in the direct opposition to the Protestant religion of the colonists. Now resistance against taxation was secondary, as the fears of religious persecution came to the forefront of the minds of all the colonists. It's important to understand that many colonists came to America fleeing the persecution of the Roman Catholics, so the thought of Quebec, which was, like I said, predominantly Roman Catholic, being extended all the way to the Ohio River, was a frightening thought indeed. That same month, the Continental Congress was established to resist the Intolerable Acts, with John Adams and his cousin Samuel Adams, as well as George Washington, Richard Henry Lee, and the orator Patrick Henry, who would famously say, Give me liberty, or give me death. By May 1775, the war had commenced between British soldiers and militia from Massachusetts, and so the Revolutionary War had begun. So to summarize what we learned today, the causes of the Revolutionary War were mostly tax-based, but some of the acts that Parliament passed caused so much fuss and infringed so much on the rights of the colonists that it even led to bloodshed. Other causes had to do with American commerce being dismantled by British Parliament, like with the Tea Act. We saw religion become an issue towards the end, as well as soldiers being sequestered in private homes. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you learned something, and if you did learn something, please remember to like this video, subscribe, and ring the liberty bell if you want to get notifications whenever I make a new video and post it here on YouTube. And as always, this has been History Abridged.